Okay, now we have the slide. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, first, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give the talk. And also, uh, I'm very excited uh, today to talk a little bit our recent research development in terms of foundations for time series data. So uh, I guess in the past decade, we have witnessed uh, major breakthroughs uh, in AI and machine learning research. Uh, this started the whole story in terms of ImageNet and later with AlphaGo, AlphaFold, Time G uh, ChatGPT, uh, and many others. So we're really expecting to asking the question, what will be happening next? In this particular conference of KDD, uh, in the past few days, we have uh, seen so many great presentations and talks, and also George's talk, uh, talking about large language model and generative AI. So for my research, I'm mostly inspired uh, by one of the quotes from Albert Einstein. Uh, he says once that uh, our human being is actually a part of a whole, uh, which we call as the universe is actually a part limited by time and space. So a lot of my research work is focused on time series and spatial temporal data. This has not been a mainstream research for many years in KDD, uh, but now it started to become a really major research thrust. And we've seen many papers uh, today at the conference and many other machine learning conferences now. Uh, this is really in, uh, inspired by many of the applications and also the data that we have collected in these applications. Next, I'm going to give a few examples. Uh, one is of them is about transportation. Uh, we get all these different type of spatial, temporal data, or time series data for transportation area, in terms of the traffic patterns, human mobility, then we'll be able to make in forecasts and provide ride sharing and et cetera. Another example is in climate science. We all know that uh, in, we are confronted with the climate change uh, grand challenge. How will we be able to actually devising AI solutions to help addressing the societal challenge is really a major uh, research problem for us. Uh, with the past decade, uh, we have witnessed a large amount of satellite data and also image data, sensing data around time series climate observations. And as we see so many papers published, either by uh, DeepMind on GraphCast, making the best prediction using data-driven approaches for near-term forecasting, uh, or recent papers on shorter, on longer-term forecasting, uh, or from NVIDIA, many other companies are starting looking at this particular problem. Another example is in the healthcare domain, where we basically get uh, also a good amount of time series observations, either in the ICU room with the sensors or in mobile health with access to human mobility, time series observations of the vital signs, then we'll be able to actually devise smart solutions to enable health uh, and also clinical care support. Last but not the least, when I talk with NVIDIA, uh, who obviously saw a large number of uh, um, uh, GPUs, uh, and now that Amazon obviously comes into play, as George mentioned, uh, that they basically uh, said, okay, actually, you may wonder what will be the largest sector that we sell GPUs to, uh, and the answer is actually in the finance domain. Uh, because obviously we see that in the finance domain, there's so much time series data about the stocks, about investment strategies, and many different other type of time series data available where they will be able to actually doing analysis and making forecasting, uh, generating good uh, management, portfolio management strategies, and et cetera. Uh, so now we see a large number of applications with time series data. At the same time, we have seen so many different advancements in terms of time series research using AI machine learning model. Um, because I know that I'm following George's talk, I also want to give some examples from Amazon. For example, that recently they introduced this Amazon time stream for time series data. Uh, and also using the Cronus system, which is public available and shared on GitHub now, where they will be able to do zero-shot probabilistic time series forecasting. So from that perspective, we can see that there's a large amount of data available. There's also the good playground that has been set up for us to do a lot of research in this area. And we have already seen some very nice examples. 
And I would say that in order to actually push in the frontiers of AI research in this particular area, we're literally confronted probably in two grand challenge. One of them is that we want to provide a qualitative description of the dynamic system that we're observing from the time series data. And this also incorporating domain knowledge sometimes, if this is a physical system, that will be a physics knowledge. And if there's other system, we're incorporating a different type of domain knowledge, either represented by logic and uh, or probabilistic reasoning and et cetera. And then when we look at them, that means that we'll be able to actually having a wide spectrum of research where we can do. For example, where we're looking at non-stationary AI, multi-resolution, physics-informed AI, and et cetera. Another grand challenge, uh, which that we talk less about, is also very important, is actually how we will be able to actually democratizing what we're looking in terms of time series and all these high dimensional data, characterizing these dynamic systems to the level that human uh, will be able to actually better understanding and also doing operations on top of it. And that means that we're building this particular system not only for the machines to making forecasting, but we also need to help the humans to better understand why we make this particular forecasting results and how we can operate on top of it. And that's why that we have different type of threads in terms of human-centered AI, interpretable AI, and obviously if the data is um, uh, located across different locations, then we were looking at distributed or federated AI. Uh, and sometimes, that ironically, that we actually have limited amount of data in many of these applications uh, where the time series data may be very limited, and there we also have to devise data-efficient uh, AI. So I think from that perspective that, as I mentioned, that we are really at a stage where we build all these foundation models for NLP, for computer vision, uh, and many others now, it is probably a right time for us to build a foundation model for time series as well. Uh, but I would say that we actually are confronted with a large number of challenges that we probably don't have a lot of research papers to talk about. Uh, so this is what we typically do, you know, that as uh, a researcher um, uh, in, that we publish papers, right? And it looks really nice on these benchmarking data sets. We achieve the best results compared with the state of our methods. That's how our research papers are published every year. With the papers of uh, time series coming more and more, and we're seeing more examples of that. Very cliche on these benchmarking data sets. And then when we look uh, or talk with researchers in the application domain with access to a large amount of time and series data, they were like, um, you know, that I use it, this and that. It doesn't seem to work really well, especially when I talk to hedge fund people, you know, they were like, hey, uh, the idea sounds great, but uh, it doesn't seem to work for our application. Uh, we've heard a lot of stories like this. Obviously, there are many, many reasons of that. Uh, but I would say that uh, let's take a look together in terms of what actually happens in the real world time series data. Basically, where we see it is this is um, one of the observation from uh, the MIMIC data set. Uh, this is the medical domain. Where we see basically now that uh, we get a lot of these um, vital signs in terms of heart rate and pH values and etc. And then we see a lot of missing data, right? Uh, the data kind of noisy and a lot of irregularly show up. That means, you know, dynamic uh, and non-stationary. Sometimes that means we also have additional information, tax data, uh, and maybe from multiple sources as well. So what we are seeing is that all these nicely formulated, we call it well curated, the benchmark data for time series are really well behaved. But what we see in the reality is that the time series observations is extremely not well behaved. And that is why that we're potentially seeing the gap for what we're seeing right now. And then, so, we think that there is a potential for us to build a foundation model for time series of spatial temporal data. But at the same time, that means that we really need to address all these unique challenges of time series where we don't see a lot in text data or in video uh, or image data. Uh, for example, I just mentioned in terms of multi-resolution, missing value, multimodality, and sometimes a lot of time we do privacy preserving. 
Uh, and then in terms of the model architecture itself, uh, we need to study in terms of what would be the right architecture, how we incorporating physics knowledge, doing causal analysis, uh, federated learning, and also interpretable machine learning. And then for time series data, what happened is that on top of it, we also need to support them in terms of the large number of tasks on top of it. Um, the most famous one people talk most is about forecasting, but we do see a lot in terms of uh, anomaly detection, causal analysis, building generative models and simulation and et cetera. So this is a really gigantic task. There's no way for me to finish this particular talk uh, on everything uh, within this limited amount of time. So today I'm going to focus a little bit about our exploration for building foundation models for time series. We really want to be gentle and really asking the question in terms of whether it would make sense to build a foundation model for time series. Uh, and then we'll see, hey, whether uh, it's making sense for us to proceed with this particular direction. And then now we need to take a little bit detour because the area has been exploding. Uh, I was, when I working on this time series research about 20 years ago, uh, there's probably a limited number of researchers, you know, uh, in the area, but now that we see thousands of papers published every year, uh, even as a researcher uh, in this area myself, I cannot keep up with all the research papers published every day or every minute as we speak. Uh, but we did a little summary in terms of what people have developed for time series prediction forecasting. For example, uh, a, the more popular approaches is based on the transformer. Uh, and then there's also the graph neural network based approaches, CN based approach, uh, self supervised or unsupervised learning models. Uh, and more recently, people are also starting to talk about linear models and et cetera. So that means that we are full of different ideas in terms of what actually may work for time series data. So the one detour we have to take to see, A, how well these methods work on the so-called benchmarking data set. So when we talk about benchmark data set, for those of you who are not familiar with the time series domain, uh, I just want to give a quick introduction. Uh, most of the machine learning papers published actually using the so-called uh, smaller scale, oh, sorry, um, smaller scale uh, data. Uh, which is uh, uh, known as electricity, weather, solar, uh, energy, traffic, and et cetera. So you, when you open any papers about uh, time series, you'll probably see these benchmark data sets. Uh, and then on the other side, there also has been uh, uh, the release of significantly larger scale data set. And when you're looking at the statistics uh, in here, uh, basically it's significantly larger. That is the New York taxi data sets and also the climate data set. Uh, we are not able to run this in the academic uh, um, uh, computing resources, and that's why we collaborated uh, with the KDDI, that is um, uh, a company in Japan, uh, where we try to do the benchmarking. Uh, and really quickly, we say that, hey, for uh, these uh, smaller scale uh, time series benchmarking data set, what we see is that for short term prediction, that is basically within, you know, 10 or 16, the definition is relatively loose, but you basically get a quick sense in terms of we're looking at a really near term prediction. Uh, it seems that we're seeing that um, sometimes the transformer based approaches work well, and sometimes the CRN based approaches work well. And then for longer term time series prediction, that is typically uh, above uh, 12 or 16 uh, until 120 and etc. Uh, then that is basically the transformer based approaches are more stable. Uh, um, and then uh, sometimes that uh, using um, also uh, transformer architecture using totem. So basically that we'll say, hey, even for the smaller benchmarking data set, the performance varies, but uh, transformer based approaches seems to be relatively stable. Uh, and then uh, when we look at uh, the bigger data sets, uh, so this is for extremely large data set. Uh, and then when we look at the long-term forecasting, that is also a very challenging problem. Uh, what we see initially that I thought, hey, that the architecture may not necessarily matter that much. Uh, because hopefully, with given this larger amount of data, uh, the differences between the architecture may wears off. 
what interesting is that it seems that it is not necessarily true for uh, the different architectures. Uh, basically, that for um, uh, transformer-based approaches, for example, this I uh, transformer or different type of um, uh, uh, transformer-based approaches, they were uh, their performance can convert into a certain extent. Uh, but there are other architectures, you know, using the D-linear model uh, or other alternative approaches, then it probably will not converge into the good performance to transformer-based approaches, even given large amount of data. So this shows to us that, hey, the architecture does seem to make a difference, especially when we are confronted with extremely challenging tasks, and therefore that maybe uh, we can stick with this particular architecture. So uh, that's a quick detour, basically, that also setting up the stage for us to think about answering all these different type of questions, building foundation models. Um, even for this, that there are a few uh, directions people have explored, right? One is that how we will be able to actually do the representation for sequential input. There is the patch to the curve, positioning embedding, and et cetera. And then in terms of the backbone I just mentioned, and we sort of agree that transformer-based approaches seems to be a nice architecture, uh, a, a relatively robust and stable one. Uh, and then afterwards, we also have to look at a large number of other challenges. Uh, one is that right now what will happen is uh, many of the papers publishing one paper for forecasting, another paper for anomaly detection, another architecture uh, for causal analysis. So that means that there are many papers published, but each of them targeting a specific task. What we want to do is this general purpose foundation models, which will be able to serve the purposes of all the different type of tasks. Because it should make sense if there is a foundation model exist. Uh, on the other side, there's also the distribution shift. Uh, the, uh, the distribution will change over the time, and that is the nature of time series. Last but not the least, a lot of time we would like to incorporate in the texture information. So in Europe's last year, that there is this paper called LM4TS paper published, which shows one of the first initial efforts where they are showing that building this foundation models for time series, they were able to achieve similar prediction performance or analysis performance across many different tasks. Uh, this is very encouraging, and that is also motivating part of us that we want to pursue this particular direction. So the first work uh, I want to mention uh, a little bit is our Temple model. Uh, the work was published in iClear earlier this year. Uh, the, the students that are uh, doing this work collaborating with Google Cloud. Uh, in there, we focus on a relatively limited task. We are saying, hey, uh, we're just uh, focusing on a forecasting task. And then given the observations of the previous K timestamp, uh, whether we'll be able to build a foundation model to making the predictions of the next H timestamp uh, without actually acting, uh, having access to the target domain we're interested in making prediction in the training model. Uh, so that is what we call as a zero throughout setting, no access to target data set during training, and then relying on the learned representation from the pre-training data from other, the, uh, other domains. And I motivate the challenge a little bit already. Basically, we really need to characterize the intrinsic properties of the time series. And then how should we do this? Uh, the way that we actually proposing to address the idea uh, is, um, consists of a few components. Uh, that is basically uh, explained in the slide uh, in terms of the architecture of the temple model. The first thing I want to bring your attention is that since we're learning from time series across many different domains, and each of them exhibit different trends, seasonality, and residuals, the first thing we need to do is really doing the STL decomposition so that we will be able to actually intrinsic, characterizing the intrinsic properties of time series without uh, the necessary condition to worry about the trend of seasonality. And that's what we do in here, that we have the time series data, and then we do the STL decomposition uh, over each time stamp, and then we'll get a time series observations of the trend seasonality and the residuals, and then putting doing the patching so that we can put all the embeddings together for the next step. 
Another uh, key component which we incorporate is trying to do the prompt design. This is something that has a lot of um, uh, discussion right now. Uh, there's a recent paper published by University of Washington where they're discussing whether it makes sense to literally just only using uh, the large language model to process and understanding the large language, uh, to understand the time series observations. Uh, here we incorporating them uh, in supplementing to what else that we're doing. Uh, in here that with the uh, prompt design component, basically we hope that we'll be able to have the model to adapt to the unseen data. But again, this is still ongoing discussion and there's a lot of research work around this direction. And next uh, component uh, is basically we do more or less similar as many others do. Uh, here that we do, uh, after we get you know, the prompt and then we do the component-wise concatenation, putting them into the transformer block, uh, and then you know, making predictions and doing the denormalization so that we can make a prediction. We also use the decoder-based GPT backbone, uh, LoRa, and et cetera, so basically more or less these are more standard. So after building uh, this temple architectures, uh, we want to just show um, uh, some, uh, I guess, uh, theoretical analysis. We're trying to say, hey, it makes sense to do this um, STL decomposition uh, because attention alone will not be able to actually detangle uh, these trend and seasonality signals from time series across different domains. Um, and then we also try to incorporate some of the time series knowledge through the soft prompt design. Uh, I mentioned a little bit, basically, the prompt that we gave is that uh, given, you know, the trend and seasonality, uh, can you predict the future time steps and, and et cetera. And this component was introduced also later, I will talk a little bit, where we want to incorporate the texture information. Okay, so uh, quickly I want to show the experiment results. Uh, for example, that here uh, we show the experiment result on the zero shot learning. Again, to just remind you basically that we train the data, for example in here, uh, that if we show the column of the electricity, that means that we are literally not using any observations from the electricity data set, but training the model using traffic, weather, uh, and energy, and uh, et cetera. Uh, and then we're testing uh, on directly making predictions uh, on the electricity data set. So across the board, over all these different type of test cases, uh, the tempo model were able to perform the best uh, compared with the state-of-art methods. Uh, that is one encouraging news. And the second one is that we want to see, hey, how these zero-shot results compared uh, with the full uh, set training. That means that, hey, we gave the model like um, uh, the full access to the training data in that target domain and to see how well it compares with the zero shot using Temple. Uh, so this slide shows the results basically for this energy data sets. Uh, our Temple model is zero shot versus others using all these other approaches I mentioned, very state of art for time series, but training literally using the full shot uh, data sets. Basically, they're training on time series data in the energy domain. And we're able to actually achieve similar results or even a little bit better. Uh, this is extremely encouraging because that means that there is some hope to do foundation models for time series forecasting itself. Uh, I wouldn't say that, hey, there is a bright future uh, very surely, but at least it shows us some uh, promises in there. Uh, and next that, you know, that I mentioned a little bit in many of the domains, we would like to incorporate the texture information. And uh, so here we are interested in this creating this multi-model data set in order to evaluate them. Uh, we have two created two da different data set. Uh, one is test, basically this is uh, time series enriched um, data with the chat GPT. Uh, uh, we use the quarterly and beta value. Uh, this is very standard in the finance domain for S&P 500. And then we also want to get the news for each particular company. Uh, in order to avoid uh, information leak, right, we know that we do not want to use the future news to making predictions for future stock because that's going to create a lot of um, overfitting issues. So we have been carefully curated so that we only get the news before the timestamp that we're making predictions on and ask ChatGPT to give us a summary. 
Another data set is the GDAL data set uh, released by Google. This is basically a social news data set, and then we have to create the time series observations. Uh, the time series observation will basically be the number of news uh, on this particular topic. So now we will be able to ac uh, give access to the data with the number, with the time series observations and also the tax data compensating for them. Uh, and then in terms of uh, the incorporating the textual information, uh, this is through the soft uh, prompt uh, design um, uh, module that I just mentioned. Uh, for example, then we will be able to actually uh, adding uh, not only you know uh, the uh, time series embedding, but also some of the news information uh, inside, uh, so that we can given uh, the um, uh, this tempo model a little bit more textual information. So uh, next, I want to quickly show the experiment results on these two data sets. Uh, if incorporating the tax information, uh, comparing with uh, other approaches where we do not use uh, times, uh, tax input, only time series observation, and obviously all these alternative approaches will be much better. And then among all these uh, multi-model, foundation model, temple model, uh, we're able to get the best results. Um, again, this is showing some promises if we incorporate in the text information, we'll be able to get better results. So to just summarize a little bit, uh, for the tempo approaches, we were able to build this prompt-based generative pre-training model, which shows promises for building a foundation model for time series. And then in the parallel, there are many models have been developed. Here I just list a few, and please do not uh, feel um, uh, ignored uh, uh, if I didn't list your approaches in there, but basically there's Kronos, Time uh, LLM, Lac Lama model, Time GPT, and many others. Basically that we see in parallel, there are many papers that are trying to explore this direction for foundation model for time series, especially focus on time, uh, on focus task. Uh, what we want to do is that we really want to go beyond forecast because there are many other tasks out there. Another one is that we also want to go beyond the benchmarking data sets, which I criticize a lot, but obviously in this temple model, uh, uh, paper that we again using this benchmark uh, data sets. So this is what we did uh, for in the summer, uh, where we present a preliminary version of the, um, the work in the ICML workshop in July. Uh, the idea is that we're actually going to build this model, which is called Time DIT. Based on the name, you can quickly see, oh, that we're actually using the diffusion transformer architectures. Uh, in there, we're trying to build this generative AI-based approaches using the transformer architecture, which can capture this long-term dependencies. And then we also want to use the diffusion model to build a generative model and distributions so that we'll be able to actually quickly adapting to the dynamic change of the time series data. And from there, we will be able to actually addressing a few issues. One is that we can handle all these many challenges I mentioned in terms of multi-resolution, missing value, noisy data, and et cetera. Another one is that this can be general purpose so that it not only can do forecasting, but also can addressing all other tasks such as anomaly detection, and generations, and et cetera. So one of the key thing in here in this particular architecture uh, is really the masking strategies. Um, so in this uh, slides, we quickly show the model, model architecture. Uh, basically in here that we can see, we get the data from uh, different domains, healthcare, sustainability, transportation. There is this really important time series masking unit so that we can address this, the unique challenges and later we'll do the embedding layer feeding into this time DIT block, which is showing here, very similar to the DIT model, but addressing some of the challenges in terms of the multi head attention, et cetera. So what is the strategy for this masking, uh, which is really essential? So we say, okay, for time series, we need specific maskings. Uh, basically that we're going to have two different type of masking. One is task agnostic. 
Uh, basically, that means that we're using this mixture of masks so that it will be actually agnostic to the self-supervised pre-training, and then the model will be able to actually reconstruct the mass values because we're seeing all these missing values and et cetera. Another one is that we want to actually do the task-specific masking uh, using the block mask or reconstruction mask so that we'll be able to do this for the fine-tuning stages. For specific tasks, if some of the data actually uh, have multi-resolution or missing data, this will be useful for that. And then with that particular architecture, uh, together uh, with the masking strategies, uh, we're actually able to achieve uh, a number of very interesting and challenging tasks. The first one I want to show you, uh, I call this as a forecasting task on the well data set. That means that we're looking at the data with um, missing value and also with uh, multi resolutions. This cannot be handled directly using all these architectures I showed, uh, even using the Temple model or Time T, uh, uh, GPT, and many others currently. Uh, so, for example, with the missing um, values, if we see that we, if we vary the missing ratio, uh, and then we are gradually seeing uh, that our time DIT model were able to achieve much better results and uh, improvement comparing uh, with the diffusion-based approaches uh, that people have used for filling the missing values. And then in terms of the multi-resolution, we see similar story where uh, uh, the time DIT model were able to achieve a significantly lower um, missing, uh, sorry, error rates. So uh, that means that there is a good hope using this diffusion-based approaches to automatically fill in the missing value through these well-designed maskings. Uh, another example I want to show is the imputation task. Uh, this one is specifically evaluation in terms of how we fill in the missing values. Story will be similar. Uh, the time DIT model were able to achieve similar or a little bit better performance than the state of art methods if you basically just fill in the imputations. Uh, and then the la next one I want to show is the t uh, g generation. Basically, that uh, what we want to do is that given a smaller number of examples in the target domain, we want to generate a synthetic data set from that target domain. And for synthetic data generation, there are a few uh, evaluation metrics. Uh, for example, one of them is so-called discriminative score, and the other is predictive score. Uh, and then comparing with either GAN-based approaches, VAE-based approaches, or diffusion-based approaches, uh, our model were able to get better scores across different uh, metrics. Uh, uh, the next one is in terms of uh, the specific um, uh, visualization. Basically, that now we do the PCA you know, decomposition. Uh, for the target domain is represented, uh, for, sorry, for uh, the original data is represented in the red dots, and then the blue one is what we generated. In general, we want them to have a good mix. So for DIT model, we can see a very nice mix between the original data and the synthetic data set. Um, but for diffusion model, we see that they started showing differences, and then um, GAN model is really weird and very bad. This is known actually for many years, we're trying to making the GAN model work for time series data. And we never were able to succeed. That's why we don't publish papers on that topic. Um, so, but basically, I think that in terms of the good mixing, uh, we also show that on uh, visualization that we were able to get a nice mix between the original data and also the generated data. Uh, so I would say that I use a quick, you know, 30 minutes also trying to give a picture in terms of what we are seeing in the next probably few time, uh, next year hopefully, you know, next few years, uh, what we could see. Basically that there is a large number of challenges we need to address, very unique to time series data. Uh, but there is also many, many additional tasks that we can address and addressing and also uh, building different novel architectures. Uh, I would like to basically end my talk uh, with this particular slide. So in this tsunami of foundation models and also the generative AI, uh, I'm this little person, you know, in front of the tsunami. Uh, I tell uh, my students and also when I gave talks, I said, you know, that this is really 
the year that I feel most nervous about. I'm nervous because that we're seeing so many papers. Uh, I'm also nervously exciting because there's so many things are going to change. Many of the things and many of the papers that we publish probably will no longer be relevant because that we are going to see potentially a paradigm shift in terms of how we work on time series data. But you know, the promises is that the future will be hopefully very nice. Uh, and then hopefully in the next year's KDD, we're going to see more papers on time series foundation models. So with that, I want to conclude and saying uh, thanks to my students and post on funding agencies. And most importantly, uh, thank you for staying with us in this beautiful city of Barcelona, uh, still um, again staying attentively for my talk. Thank you. Mm -hmm.